Hello everyone and welcome to the third in a series of biology review videos. These are meant to help students review essential content for the end of course SOL biology test done in Virginia, but they can be used as a refresher on a lot of basic biology topics for exam review. If you're coming from another state as you follow along, I encourage you to use the resources linked in the video description and go ahead and subscribe if you find this kind of material useful for biology science exam review. So in this video, we're going to be covering three different topics, the classification of life, evolution, and ecology. So buckle up, let's get started. Scientists classify organisms into different groups or categories, and this includes all organisms that are currently living today that we know about and every organism that we've discovered from the past. And they base these categorizations and hierarchies on similarities in their morphology or physical structures, on their developmental stages, so embryology, and they use information like biochemical data. But we can draw conclusions about organisms that lived in the past based on data we collect from the fossil record. Now, there's been many different classification systems over time. It used to be just two groups, plants and animals, and then it got a little bit more specific. In the past, there's been the kingdom structure. Now we organize all living things into three major domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, or organisms with a nucleus. So let's talk about these domains a little bit more. Bacteria, of course, we covered in our previous video. We know bacteria can cause disease, but bacteria are super prevalent all across the globe, and most bacterial species don't cause disease. And there's a lot of them that are really beneficial, that help us create food, like cheeses and yogurt and others that help us produce medicines. Archaea is its own domain, and these are also prokaryotic organisms like bacteria. They do not have a nucleus. Many archaea are known for being extremophiles, meaning they live in really extreme environments, or really hot environments, environments that are extremely acidic, or really harsh environments. And then eukarya includes anything with a nucleus, so that's plants, animals, fungi, protus, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So these levels of classification are the different categories that we organize organisms into, and different species may have slightly slightly different levels of classification depending on what you're looking at. Some plants don't go exactly with all of these levels and sublevels, but domain is the largest and then it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. This is the typical categorization for all living things. And genus and species are those are the two most specific categories for the most part. Sometimes we can have a subspecies. And we use these two categories to create the scientific name for an organism. Now, a scientific name follows the binomial nomenclature format, and every organism ever discovered is given a scientific name that is two words. The first word comes from the genus group, and the second word comes from its very specific species group. So its full species name or full scientific name is those two parts put together, the genus and the species. And so it's always two words, uh, unless we have a subspecies, and it's always kind of Latin sounding, it's always in italics, the first word is capital, and the second word begins with a lowercase letter. So some common organisms you might know, here are their scientific names, Gallus gallus, that's a chicken, Suscrofa, that's our boar here, Entamoeba histolytica, that is an amoeba, and Toxicodendron roticans, that is poison ivy. And anytime a new organism dis is discovered, they are given a new scientific name. What's cool about these is that they are the same all across the globe. Everyone can identify, for example, a chicken as Gallus gallus. So we don't have any language barriers there. Now within eukaryotes or organisms with a nucleus, animals is probably one you're very familiar with, plants, fungi, and of course, protists. They used to be a kingdom themselves, but they're actually uh, so different that we have a bunch of different categories for them. And so going backwards through these categories, protists are usually uh, unicellular. There's some multicellular protists like kelp, uh, but they are eukaryotic, so they do have a nucleus and other complex organelles. They have a bunch of different adaptations for movement like cilia or pseudopods as part of their cellular structures. Fungi can be unicellular like yeast or multicellular like these mushrooms here. And they are organisms with cell walls, so each of their cells has a cell wall like plants do, but unlike plants, fungi have chitin, which is a special material that helps it maintain its structure. All fungi are heterotrophs, meaning they have to get their food from another source. They can't produce it themselves. And so fungi typically are decomposers. They can also be parasites as well. And so they'll break down dead organisms for their nutrition. Plants are autotrophic, so these are typically green. They will be performing photosynthesis in order to get the food that they need so they use sunlight energy and convert that into glucose or other organic compounds and within the plant kingdom we have things like mosses and ferns gymnosperms or conifers and angiosperms or flowering plants and then of course animals here these are multicellular organisms they do not have a cell wall they are heterotrophic and they consume their food 
in a variety of different ways. It can be herbivores or carnivores or omnivores. Now, when we establish these groups or relationships between different organisms, uh, we can organize them in different ways. One way to display how organisms are related is through a diagram called a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. And these can be drawn in many different ways, but it's a model that helps us visualize relationships between organisms and we can see different branching lines and different directions uh, for how groups have evolved or how they're related. And so a group is typically at the end of a branch and we can work backwards to see where a common ancestor might have existed between two different organisms or two different organismal groups. We also might see hash marks or these lines here representing different traits that have evolved at different times within evolutionary history. So anything that comes after a particular trait means it has it. So for here with seeds, it means that anything that comes after the seeds mark, like pine trees and flowering plants, have seeds as a characteristic. Now, moving into evolution, the concept of biological evolution uh, uses a lots of different types of evidence in order to support our understanding of it. Now, we can use other biochemical evidence to help us determine which proteins and DNA are similar in different organisms. This helps us construct our tree of life and gathers more evidence for evolution, helps us figure out how different organisms are related to each other. We can also use embryonic development, fossil evidence, or morphology or different physical characteristics to determine which organisms might be related and where they came from. We know that Earth's present-day species developed from earlier distinct species. When we get new combinations of existing genes or mutations in genes, and these are inherited, they can be passed on to offspring and we can see variations in populations. For example, if there's a random mutation in this DNA where this A is changed into a G, this could then produce a different amino acid, which could then lead to a different function of a protein and give us a different trait. Mutations can be caused by different mutagens like radiation or chemicals, but they can only be passed onto offspring if they occur in sex cells. If we have mutations occurring in body cells, they're only gonna be passed to other body cells that arise from the mitosis or the cell growth of current cells in the body. Over time, organisms that are better adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. For example, if we have a population of bacteria and some of those bacteria are naturally resistant to antibiotics, when we treat that population with antibiotics, only the ones with the resistance will survive. Then that gives way to give the opportunity to the resistant bacteria to survive and reproduce and pass on the resistant gene to their offspring. And what we've done here is created an antibiotic resistant population. The resistant bacteria were more fit and they have survived and reproduced at a greater rate than non-resistant bacteria. When there is more variation within a species and a species is more genetically diverse, they are more likely to survive when there's changes in the environment. When we have different types of adaptations, these can lead to the survival of different organisms. We know that behavioral adaptations, structural adaptations, and reproductive adaptations have helped different organisms survive through hundreds and thousands and millions of years. Remember that there's no one ultimately evolved organism. Environments are constantly changing, and so populations will continue to change. Also remember that individuals do not evolve, populations evolve, and evolution is just the change in different frequencies of different alleles over time. Sometimes we can have extinction of a species when we don't have adaptive characteristics that are sufficient for survival. We do see a lot of extinction in the history of life on Earth, and most of the species that have ever existed on Earth are actually now extinct, and we can tell this by the fossil record. Now moving into ecology. Remember life is organized. It's one of our characteristics of life. We know that a group of organisms of one species in one location is a population, and populations can be categorized by functions that they serve. Right here we're looking at a food web. Organisms are characterized in different trophic levels or energy levels depending on where they feed and what they consume. Producers can generate their own food, usually from sunlight energy, sometimes chemical energy as well. Consumers consume the producers and decomposers break down organic material from other organisms. A food chain shows one pathway of energy flow. A food web, like you see here, can show the interconnectedness of many food chains within a particular ecosystem. Keep in mind that on a food web, the arrows always point towards the consumer or the organism that is doing the eating. So here we have the rabbit arrow pointing towards the cougar or mountain lion, which means the rabbit is getting eaten by the cougar or mountain lion. He is doing the eating, so the arrow points into his belly. Important word here is an autotroph, also known as a producer, but these are organisms that can make their own food or are able to form their own organic molecules for food. Plants are autotrophic. Heterotrophs are organisms that must consume other organic compounds for food, and that means consuming other organisms. Heterotrophs are consumers. For example, humans are able to obtain nutrients by consuming other organisms or the products of other organisms. Right here we're looking at a trophic pyramid. At the bottom we have producers, then we have our primary consumers, 
followed by our secondary consumers and our tertiary consumers. At each level in a trophic pyramid, we know that energy is lost, usually as heat, but up to 90% of energy is lost every time you go up a level in an energy pyramid. We know that it's more efficient to consume lower on the pyramid than it is to be a tertiary or quaternary consumer. I wanna go back to talk about how all energy on Earth is really supported by the sun. And of course, all matter here on Earth is here to stay, and the atoms and molecules that we interact with and make up our bodies are the same atoms and molecules that were here hundreds of thousands of years ago. Think about how carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen all combine and recombine together and are passed through different food and matter systems. But analyzing the flow of energy and the cycling of matter within an ecosystem is an important part of biology. So this diagram is something that you might want to consider. These plants are going to use carbon from the atmosphere to undergo photosynthesis and create glucose and oxygen, which are our ingredients for respiration. But if we think about if more snails are added to this container, what effect is it going to have on the plants in the container? Eventually, if we add more snails, we would see more carbon dioxide and more carbon dioxide would lead to more plant growth because the plants could take in more carbon dioxide to perform more photosynthesis. Now, where there are lots of ways that matter and energy are cycled throughout the planet, the carbon cycle is one example of that, and there's lots of different processes where carbon, that element, is converted or passed between different organisms or between organisms and the environment. So from the air, plants and other things like phytoplankton in the water can take in carbon as carbon dioxide and use that in the process of converting sunlight energy into organic compounds. So the carbon dioxide in the air goes directly into those organic compounds or things like glucose. And then all living things perform respiration. But in the process of respiration, we use that glucose to generate ATP, which is another molecule organisms use for energy. So that process is respiration. So if we follow the path of carbon here, we say that carbon can come from the atmosphere into photosynthetic organisms like trees and then can be consumed by other organisms so when, so when animals eat plants, they're taking in carbon that way, and then they're exhaling carbon dioxide after the process of respiration. Now, not all the carbon leaves their bodies. Eventually, they will die, and after death, the carbon can be returned to the environment through the help of decomposers who will break down the carbon in dead organisms' bodies, and that decomposition process will release carbon either back into the soil or back into the atmosphere. Another way carbon can enter the atmosphere is by is through combustion. So the combustion of fossil fuels also releases lots of carbon into the atmosphere. And when there's lots of carbon in the atmosphere, it actually can be taken up by the waters in the ocean. And sometimes we have lots of carbon going into oceans, and that carbon actually turns into carbonic acid in solution in water, which leads to a lots of ocean acidification. So the more carbon in the atmosphere, the more the oceans can take in, and the more acidic the oceans get, which is not always great for the ecosystems there. The nitrogen cycle is another important biochemical cycle and bacteria play a huge role in the nitrogen cycle. There's actually different types of bacteria in the different steps of the nitrogen cycle. We just have the same picture here. But these different species will help convert nitrogen in the atmosphere. Remember, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, and we need nitrogen in things like our DNA and our proteins. Plants and animals can't take that nitrogen from the air, the N2 gas, uh, out of the air themselves, and they need bacteria to do it. So that atmospheric nitrogen is fixed by nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil. But then the problem is that most of the time after that first fixation process, it gets changed into ammonium, which is pretty toxic. So there's other bacteria that convert it into nitrites and nitrates, which can then be taken up by plants, and then animals get the nitrogen by eating plants. When they die, we also have decomposers like bacteria and fungi breaking down the organic materials in organisms' bodies, and that, of course, will convert the nitrogen back into ammonium in the soil. So we have bacteria that can return it back to the cycle, or we have denitrifying bacteria that participate in denitrification and allows it to go back to the gaseous form of N2 into the atmosphere. Also, lightning is involved in the nitrogen cycle as well. Sometimes we can have nitrogen converted from the atmosphere through this process. In one ecosystem, we have lots of biotic, living, or abiotic factors. And an ecosystem is shaped by the interactions between these non-living and living factors. In every single environment, there is competition between different organisms and interactions between different populations. And often, within one ecosystem or environment, there are natural checks in place that keep populations and ecosystems relatively stable over hundreds or thousands of years. Though sometimes we might see certain individuals that have 
what looks like unlimited or exponential growth, most of the time, most populations will reach what we call as a carrying capacity within a particular environment. Because there are limited resources within a particular environment, like food availability, water, space, at some point those organisms are going to reach the maximum population that that ecosystem or environment is able to sustain. And even though that may fluctuate over time, a population may be relatively stable once it hits its carrying capacity. If we see a sharp decline like this, it's probably because there was an introduction of a disease, or a new predator, or an invasive species. All of these biological molecules can be limiting as well, so the number of organisms any particular habitat or ecosystem can support is dependent on the availability of certain resources within that environment. For example, energy, water, oxygen, nutrients, all of those are going to have an effect on how many organisms an environment can support. All ecosystems are going to go through a sequence of progressions from primary succession and secondary succession, and these are changes where the ecological community modifies the environment, making it more suitable for more organisms. And this can take hundreds or thousands of years, and eventually it'll become a stable ecosystem. Now, after succession slows down and we have an established community, it's often called a climax community. And in Virginia, most climax communities are going to be hardwood forests, so oak forest, hickory forest. So if you're walking around in nature, take a look at the types of vegetation that you see and think about what stage in ecological succession that you're in. So as we know, the earth has finite resources and increasing human consumption of those resources is definitely placing a lot of stress on the natural world and different environments. So even though we are part of the Earth's ecosystems, we also can have lots of negative effects on them. For example, the introduction of invasive species can be really destructive to native organisms within an environment. This is a picture of kudzu here that has overtaken a wooded area because it doesn't have any natural predators and can grow very fast and outcompete the native organisms. Pollution from humans is also another major human impact in the environment. As we have an increase in human populations, we're going to have more rapid depletion of our natural resources and more species are going to go extinct. Habitat loss is the number one reason a particular organism will go extinct. And so when we talk about protecting threatened or endangered species, protecting their habitats is a major way we can protect them. And of course, there's other large scale changes that can influence ecosystems. So one of those is eutrophication when there's when we have a whole bunch of nutrients and excess of nutrients added to added to something like a pond. Then we have an excess growth of things like algae, which throws off the balance of other organisms within a water ecosystem and leads to overall poorer water quality. We can also have a drastic change with things like a fire or a flood or a drought, which could be related to human impacts or, or other natural causes. So that was a really quick review of some important topics in the content that you'll need to know for the biology SOL. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to go back and review part one and part two if you have not already seen those videos. Give this video a like if it's been helpful. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you later.